All right. So this this cafe uh, is going to be based on some of the selections from Nora Bateson. Um, we, we've had a reading group, Reader's Underground group for the Gregory Bateson uh, Ecology of Mine and Nora Bateson's small arcs of larger circles. Uh, it's been going on for a few months now. We, we're taking a break and um, the material for me is new. It's mostly um, Jeffrey and Johnny who put together the, the reading group. They've been the, the knowledgeable um, duo that, that um, has helped guide the conversations. Uh, Michael has joined in as well on the conversations. We've had a few other um, attendees from across the pond uh, in, in England. We have a four week gap while Jeffrey is on a writer's retreat and I felt that some of Nora Bateson's material is trickling in, or, or the concept of these these um, interlocking, intersteeping, interweaving. Uh, there's a lot of terms out there that Mark does not like. That um, before the call, which before I logged on, um, sounded like. Uh, there was a little bit of disgruntlement between the, the Gill friend and the Nora Bateson chat, which was posted on the forum. And, and perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that, which I, I can understand the, once, once this type of talk that Nora Bateson is getting into um, becomes more concrete or the terms become used or or it's actually talked about it does does have a, a ring of kind of out there thought but but at the same time what she's getting at is what's all around us she equates learning with living or life with a constant learning um, and There was also a, a short video that she, she's also a, a, produces her own video content. Uh, she, she produced a full length documentary um, based on her father's life, Gregory Bateson, Ecology of Mind, or Ecologies of Mind, I think is what it's called, which I have yet to see, but um, posted a 10 minute clip of one of her videos, which is very interesting, um, artsy. But I don't want to take up the, the time here with uh, me rambling on. So we can open this discussion up to however we would like to frame it. Um, we have various individuals from all separate nests, perhaps. Uh, and we've, we've had talks similar to this before. Um, but Nora Bateson's theory, um, and, and Gregory Bateson, if we want to introduce Gregory Bateson to this discussion, um, they, there's, there's this connective, uh, uh, like the theory, there, there's nest, the nested theories of, say, Ken Wilber, of others, of integral theory or integrating um, the parts with the holes. Um, and Wilbur uses holons, for example, um, which, uh, but Nora Bateson is getting at something different here. And she uses, she coins the term semathesy, which is basically learning together. Uh, and I'd like for us to do whatever we want to do here to just reach whatever point we need to reach. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to just jump in there, anyone? Um, I'm gonna jump in because I'm gonna spin off of what Mark said, which 
um, I get the feel. I uh, I feel your mark. Um, the thing is, is that for me, listening to somebody else use language is like listening to somebody play music. And everybody has a unique way of putting together words, using words, and sometimes it takes time to get used to and uh, follow. Um, and sometimes, you know, I really don't like the way they use language, but I try to challenge myself. I just finished the book Flip. And I was telling Ed that going off of his language, I reading it was like an outer body experience <laughs> in the sense that the words and the ideas that he was putting together, I really had to uh, do some deep listening without feeling like, or without projecting that he has to say it the way I want it to be said. And I think that's a challenge in this day and age of how to listen to somebody use language, especially if we're not used to it. It's To me, it's very similar to trying to go to, uh, uh, well, I can go stay right here and go and try to talk to somebody that speaks Spanish and I know very little about it, but I know that if I engage with somebody that speaks Spanish, I may not understand the words, but there's another language I'm, I'm gonna tap into and that's the nonverbal. And that's been very helpful to augment with verbal language and trying to uh, at least do a, a good job of um, interacting with somebody that comes from a different place than me. So um, I understand how because I watched the video too, there's a lot of jargon from her point of view, but I just take it, well, you know, everybody has an idiosyncratic way of using language that I think we need to agree or disagree with. But I, for me, I'm, uh, I don't wanna, or I practice at least giving it a chance to hear through it, like listening to jazz, like listening to music that I'm unfamiliar with. I want to dig deep and, and be with them as much as possible to get the gist of what they're trying to express. And I think, I love Nora's use of language, but I think it's because uh, I resonate with her combining poetry with nature, with science. So that's what I have to say about that. Your turn, Doug. <laughs> so thanks for your input there, Michael. I just had a question since a few of us came in late, exactly what the issue was that you had, Mark, with, um, or maybe it wasn't just you, maybe it was you and Ed, but um, with, with the language or the use of, or the selection of video, which again, it's my own selection, it's not yours. So it, it's not going to speak to everyone. And perhaps that way, is that what you were getting at? Is it, it didn't resonate or mean much to you or the speakers were talking past your reality, perhaps? <laughs> No, I, I think what, what Mark and I, if, I, if I can jump back in here, I, what Mark and I were noting, um, and it's something that we, we share, uh, I, I feel very strong. There's, there is simply a lot of jargon that gets thrown around. And it's just jargon. And it's sometimes very difficult to follow what people are saying because they're jargonizing what they're saying instead of just saying it. At least that's, I, I, don't, I don't feel that, that Nora or Gil overdid it, but it was, but it, but it becomes very apparent that if you're not really like in that 
particular field, um, you can get lost very easily. And it's, and, and, and I suppose it places in, I, I saw the, the, you know, the uh, Commonwealth Club video. That's what, you know, I, I think what we were referring to. And, and it's not overly done, but it's done. And one of the points that I, I really appreciate about what, what Nora is trying to do is we have so many things that we really have to pay attention to. And part of the problem that we have is that every discipline uses its own jargon to describe things. So that in a lot of cases, they're all talking about the same thing, but they don't know that they are. And then this revelation comes that, oh, we're talking about the same thing. And if we, and if we express things, I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer, even though I, I make up words or coin things and like the clever turn of phrase, I actually think that everything, regardless of how complex and complicated it might be, can be expressed in one syllable words. So there's a bit of a hyperbole in there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start counting. Which is not a, which is not a one syllable word, obviously. <laughs> so, but, I, but the point is, it can be reduced to simpler words and still convey what it is we're trying to say. But because we're trying to say so much, I think sometimes we resort, resort <clears throat> to like larger concepts or notions and that what I refer to then as jargon to try to encapsulate a lot of things instead of just take a little more time and say it simply so that everybody can get along, you know, can, can follow along. Um, I, I'm, I'm a, one of those big fans. This is what I like about Richard Feynman. He, he writes on quantum physics. But you don't need more than a third grade vocabulary to follow the man. Because he's really, he breaks it down in, really into simplest terms and explains it in, very, in, in a very clear way. If you can't do that, one point that Feynman and I agree on, if you can't explain it, to a person who has no idea what you're talking about, then you don't know what you're talking about to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> so again, a bit overstated, but it's, it's in that direction. And, and, and what, I, what I appreciate, because this does come out of Nora's poetry, it's very straightforward. There, there is not a lot of that hyperbole, jargonization, and whatnot. And, and these ideas come across, you know. So it, it can, one can get carried away and academics tend to, I believe for the most part, this is what I also appreciated about Kripal's book. It was not overly jargonized. It was, it was kind of written in a very conversational way and got across a lot of very deep thoughts without having to do that. Even though every once in a while you kind of slide into it kind of unavoidable but that that's i think that's what we were we were referring to every every once in a while we curmudgeons have to have to just sit down and go you know well, why do you have to say it it's so complicated you know like <laughs> just say what you mean mean what you say no be very very simple that's all i so the, i the I secret can't to good comedy is timing i, I want to say something different um Language and music, what's the relationship between song and speech? Between um, different kinds of discourse and mixed discourse events. Like uh, this whole book, Honor's book is contrasting large sections of prose with poetry. And some of the prose is different kinds of prose. Some of it's personal reflections and personal anecdotes, and some of it is uh, drawing upon different scientists uh, and social theorists like her father and her grandfather. Her grandfather coined the term genetics, and her father coined the term schismogenesis, and she uh, came up with her own term, somathesy. Um, so they're, they're very playful and creative with language. Um, she asks a question in that video, um, can art reveal another version of the world? 
what world, what self. Um, and I want to um, I want to try everyone's patience here um, because I'm going to recite a passage, not recite. I'm I'm going to read it actually from Shakespeare, about 400, 500 years ago. The Duke of Burgundy, after the, the Battle of Agincourt, this is from Henry V. His, he has a, um, he's required to create a, a, priest, a peace process after this bloody, gory battle between England and France. And it's a very formal occasion a very high level discourse event. He's addressing a king, a king of France and the, and the king of England, and he wants them to create peace. A high level, high valued uh, abstraction, peace, but he makes it in this speech, I think, extremely concrete. And he uses the metaphor of a garden. And I hesitate to call this, well, it's almost like an aria. Um, I think it's almost like so more song than speech. And I am very reluctant to, to read it out loud because I don't think I understand it, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> and I've looked up some of these words. And by the way, Shakespeare's vocabulary, he had about 25,000 words. Milton had half that much. So we're talking about someone who made up words and never used them again but they became part of the English language. <clears throat> anyway, here it goes. Here's, this is the Duke of Burgundy, an elder gentleman, an elder statesman speaking to um, these two kings. And he wants to create a new order. He wants to reshape and restore order. Let it, not be, let it not disgrace me if I demand before this royal view what rub or what impediment there is, why that the naked, poor, and mangled peace, dear nurse of arts, plenties, and joyful births, should not in this best kingdom of the world, our fertile France, put up her lovely visage. Alas, she hath from France too long been chased, and all her husbandry doth lie on heaps, corrupting in its own fertility. Her vine, the merry cheerer of the heart, unpruned dies. Her hedges, even pleached like prisoners, wildly overgrown with hair, put forth disordered twigs. The fallow leaves, the darnel, hemlock, and rank cemetery doth root upon, while that the coulter rusts that should deracinate such savagery. That even me, that erst brought sweetly forth, the freckled cowslip, burnet, and green clover, wanting scythe withal, uncorrected, rank, conceives by idleness and nothing teems but hateful docks, rough thistles, kexies, burrs, losing both beauty and utility. And all our vineyards, fallows, meads, and hedges, defective in their natures, grow to wildness, even so our houses and ourselves and children have lost or do not learn for want of time the sciences that should become our country, but grow like savages, as soldiers will that nothing do but meditate on blood to swearing and stern looks, diffused attire, and everything that seems unnatural. Which to reduce unto our former favor you are assembled, and my speech entreats that I may know why gentle peace should not expel these inconveniences and bless us with her former qualities. And then begins the, nego the peace negotiation between these warring factions. This I believe is a, this is a discourse in this speech. I think Shakespeare offers us a discourse about discourse. And I wanna, and I wanna make one more quote maybe a couple more quotes, but this one is from a contemporary of ours, Charles Taylor, he's writing on language. And he's talking about metapragmatics, the study of uh, what we're doing here actually. Uh, what, I, what, I could, what I, my main motivation for coming here is to study the discourse uh, and see if we can elevate the discourse even a little bit 
on each of these calls, I think is, a, is of a great, a great benefit to each of us and all of us. Um, but Charles Taylor's talking about meta-pragmatics. He says, he's talking about making a promise. When all recognize situations in which, we all recognize situations in which the footing I am on with you, or the footing which anyone is on with anyone else in our society, makes it such that when I say to you, I'll be there tomorrow, I commit myself. Saying this constitutes a promise, but we could well imagine a world in which this term has yet to be invented. But a sense of shock or violation ensues when I don't turn up and everyone knows that I didn't have a valid reason. If our world evolves so that lots of people imitate my deplorable behavior and then afterwards say, I thought yesterday that I could make it, but it turns out I couldn't. Thus interpreting their original statement more as a prediction than as a commitment. We then may feel that we may have to ask people who say, I'll be there. Is that a prediction or a promise? The word is now used to shape the pragmatics of discourse. So I'm, I, I go through despair, lots of it, almost every day, by the missed opportunities I see all around me. The people who say, I'll be there, and then they don't show up, or they do show up, and the cell phone, they get a call from someone and they say, oh, I got to take this call. That started in the 90s. Um, then around, I noticed, uh, around the time of the last recession, it just became the new norm that by the time people showed up, everyone was going to be answering their cell phones. And, you know, I, I just got up in more than one occasion these, with very dear friends that I had known for many decades. I said, excuse me, <laughs> I'm gonna go wash the dishes right now. And, um, you know, everyone was very curious about the rudeness of their behavior by saying, I apologize ahead of time. But I think that now what happens when this kind of, people make promises that they don't keep. And I'm actually, I've done this myself many times. I haven't been able to keep my promises. And how that feels when you can keep a promise and when you can't keep a promise. And, um, and I think the, what happens when on a very large scale, people stop making, keeping their promises or even hoping to keep their promises. What kind of politics what kind of discourse emerges out of that? And I think we all know, we get the, the Congress, the United States Congress, and we get President Trump, we get Brexit. Um, and once again, I'm gonna to try to reconnect this to the question that um, Nora asks, can art reveal another version of the world? I think that's an interesting question. Uh, but here, uh, if I could just bring it into the, the, the public-private interplay, that, that fine line between the public and the private, how do we turn first-person accounts into something that's valuable and useful for uh, the groups that we're members of? And how do we hold each other to account? Um, or are we just gonna live in a world where there no one needs to make a promise about anything. I think the, the, the joy of reading her, her, her book along with her father, his book, um, is that there's a, it's something intergenerational that you can hear in their use of language. Um, he's very eloquent, but he's also coming from a different kind of tradition in a way than she is. I mean, he was, he was born before the atomic bomb <laughs> and certainly before the sexual revolution of the 60s. And she's definitely a child of the, she was born, I think, in the 60s or maybe even in the 70s. But I think there's a, a, a huge difference. I think she says something about trans contextuality. Um, 
and this is a real pleasure for me. Uh, she's talking about it's 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 this context, this context, this context, and what do all those different <coughs> contexts share? And this is her. It, this is beyond disciplinarity or interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, maybe even beyond transdisciplinarity. I think she's calling it transcontextuality. But I think I've, I've tried to embody this in practices in this call today, going starting with a very archaic language of Shakespeare <coughs> and moving to Charles Taylor, a, a contemporary uh, philosopher of language, and uh, looking at what she's doing in, in this text, which I think is a really good example of uh, of uh, this transcontextuality, of how she moves from prose to poetry and different kinds of prose. And I hope that we can uh, continue at our best as a group to encourage and to sponsor these kinds of chaotic, messy discourse events, um, where we're not quite sure what the fuck that other guy is talking about, but on another level, it doesn't matter. The fact is, you showed up. He showed up. Let's show some respect. <laughs> because that's increasingly becoming something, a very, a very rare virtue. Thank you. I think it's useful to, when we're, when we're talking about talking as, as Nora Bateson would talk about or Gregory Bateson would talk about, I, I, I noticed two directions we could go in, perhaps what you were talking about. Um, and I, I I guess I wanted to get at, it's useful to check in with each other. That, that seems to be the starting point and that can go with anything like Gil Ferrand and Nora Bateson do at one point. They kind of check in on their language um, or, or what we're doing here, um, which Ed is very good about detecting what language we use for the discussion right at the beginning, or at least whenever he gets the chance to talk over the rest of us. And so I, I like that type of talking that guides and, and what you just did there guides us in a certain direction. But if I was to check in as an example, I haven't had much time to jump on the forum. Plus I'm not good about talking about talking when I'm writing. So I, I refrain from that to a certain extent. Uh, but I've been reading quite a bit um, there's about 20 threads that reconnect with what we talked about here. Um, but Anna Arendt, uh, reading The Human Condi Condition. I think that's a very useful book, which led me to a few podcasts. Um, there's one that Marco listens to that he mentioned a while back, and um, he had one on Anna Arendt. And Entitled Opinions is the name of this. I forget the man's name. I bypass names and go straight to what the discussion is about. But he has, he does 10 to 15 minute monologues, which are very interesting and poetic and takes language from Shakespeare or from the Greek Roman tradition and brings that into the conversation before the conversation starts. And that's why I ask all of you to either lead a cafe or have your own words because I, I don't come from these traditions that bring out the, the deeper conversation. And traditions can also be 
in family conversation and whatnot. But as I learn to discourse with others, I really enjoy listening, but also learning how to tie in my learning with what um, we do here. So, so thank you, John, and others uh, for the dire direction you're leading us in. And if we want to tie this back in with Nora Bateson, we can, but um, she'll, she'll enter the conversation soon enough, I'm sure. There was something in the flip, and I can't remember, maybe Ed knows, of how language has literally anatomically reshaped our, our brain and the way we experience the world. Do you remember that, Ed? I read the book, Michael. I didn't memorize it. I don't know exactly. Well, I just, I just freshly... <laughs> I just freshly <laughs> finished it, so I just thought maybe that, it was an intriguing idea of how, yeah, that, 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 which is good. <laughs> there are a lot of them in there, so just go with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, and I I can't remember who he used to say it. Is that um, you know as we use language, it kind of shapes our own neurons in our brain of how we're going to construct, structure our worldviews. I think that's pretty damn on, on target myself. And, and I speak from somebody that didn't learn how to talk until he was four years old and I've had a speech impediment and I've had a hyper obsession with how to use words and speak up with that fine line of public and private that John talks about and how people on the other side, um, for whatever reason, I'm trying to be careful of not being too, uh, um, coming from an old place of being filled with rage with the way people interacted with me attempting to use language to talk about something and them pushing back on, pushing back on me in a way that, to put it bluntly, just led me to feel, well, you really aren't listening or don't want to listen to me attempt to use words to express myself. Uh, so I, I think this is, a, and I think Nora, Nora is in, in this area too of just, because she's always pointing to, uh, from my point of view of, of making us aware of we're embedded in an environment and our own bodies are a system embedded in a larger system. And she, she's beautiful of trying to say that's, that can be a difficult thing, but it's also a beautiful thing if we, from her approach, I think she's trying to help us engage it in a more artistic way. Did you have something to say, Marco? No, I'm waiting for Marco. He's got to leave. You're muted, Marco. I was waiting for you, Mark. I've written books. You can read about me in books. I'm waiting. I want to hear what you have to say. Okay, I don't exactly know what I have to say. Uh, I have um, a mouth, <laughs> I have lungs. Uh, there's something potentially resembling a brain uh, <laughs> up here. <laughs> Things happen in it, <laughs> noises emanate. Um, I'm. I'm interested in this conversation um, mainly as a 
listener because I um, uh, feel both an intellectual and a personal affinity with Nora Bateson. Uh, I have not studied her work in depth. I've just flipped through a few of the chapters in her book. I just got it last week, actually, uh, before the topic came up. So it was timely. Uh, and I know that there's been a reading group going that is doing something really interesting, which is braiding to together Nora's work with her father Gregory's work. And I'm a father and I have a daughter. Uh, and although I haven't followed that discussion closely, uh, the little bits that have trickled into my awareness have struck that chord, that, that um, intergenerational um, chord. And I imagine that part of who Nora is, part of who she is, and is has been shaped by her father, Gregory, and the way that he interacted with her and um, taught her, that might be too strong a word, but sort of guided her attention. Kind of in, I, I don't know exactly what they did, but there are points in her film, which I, I did watch, uh, where she pays tribute to the way in which her father taught her to see or showed her how to observe the world, how to look at something particular, and then also how to see patterns between things. And so just that little bit that I got has gotten me reflecting on how I interact with my daughters because she's kind of like a model for what could a, you know, a, the child of a, of, a certain, of a certain ecology, let's say, how would they grow? Like a, a people grow kind of like plants grow. Right? And the environments in which we grow and how we learn to adapt to those environments shape who, who we become. And, and then in the world as it is now, we can move around so we can go between contexts. We're not just in a particular you know, local uh, terroir, to use a jargony word. Terroir is the, <laughs> the, the flavor, the particular flavor of, of a region. Right, so a wine has a particular terroir, or a food has a terroir. That's a French word. Um, don't tell me why it came to mind. See, I'm just, it's just a brain doing stuff. You see, um, but but what um, you know what happens though is that those environments shape us, and then we move in the world, and we we can go between contexts, but we carry our contexts with us in our style or language you know, our whole, our, our whole being. And I think that what the, what I, my superficial um, impression of what Gregory and Nora and that lineage, that sort of thought genetic, that gen, like the genetics of that thought, what, what would you call it? Like the, the strain? <laughs> I don't know. The, um, but there's a certain quality to what that is, and that's just what it is. It, and it's a, it's a hybrid, right, of, of these different influences. Uh, and I think that's what the Shakespeare piece was also speaking with, is that the, the quality of, of the, the vegetable, you know, the, the vegetable quality of, of our thought, of our language, of our ideas, of our stories, of our relationships, because they're all... You know, we all have family relationships that shape, you know, how we relate, right? Uh, and that that is not so easy to talk about because it doesn't have this mechanistic simplicity to it. Like a, in a mechanism, there's it's bounded. Like it has clear beginning and end. An algorithm has an end, right? You input something, you output something. A bunch of stuff happens in between, but all of that can be constrained. And in a living system, there's an openness to it. There's a spatial openness because living systems interact with other living systems simultaneously, but then there's a temporal openness because they're moving into, um, they're moving through time. So I, I think that in the language, there is, this is just my subjective impressions of, um, 
there's that in betweenness and a kind of amorphousness because it's not bounded within a particular systemic context. It's sort of, and, and there is a difference there, going back to Doug's earlier point, between like the Wilberian and the kind of integral philosophy that gives you a framework and tells you where everything fits on that framework and how it all interconnects and works. There's a difference between that kind of discourse, that kind of way of mode of description, that style of description, and one which is fluid between multiple contexts and doesn't have a bounded final kind of edge. Uh, and I think those, I, I know this is almost a, you know, this is a very common phrase out of, out of in debates and discords, th those are differences that make a difference, let's say. And, and I think they're aesthetic differences. They're differences that one feels. And, you know, that is a guide. How we feel is, is a guide, just like with music. It's like if it, you know, if it doesn't, there's, I saw a cartoon the other day. Who posted? Maybe Doug, you posted it. Somebody posted it, but it was a playground. And then there was a swing set, but there wasn't a swing. And then the character says, it don't mean a thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, any, anyway, uh, that's, that's how I'm relating to this. And that's uh, what I'm listening to and for in, in the dialogue is that the, the, the in-between spaces and how, how, the, how the contexts connect. Wasn't it Bateson also defined information difference that makes a difference? Wasn't that's that right. One? That's where that comes from. I, and that's interesting in terms of just beginning with understanding how we're systems that do notice information differences and that feeds, feeds us. Like even the information that somebody doesn't agree with me is information. How I respond to that information is very important though. There's also, I think, um, this gets a little bit out there, but there's like levels of information. So okay. like fractal levels, for example, like I've been noticing the birds a lot. Uh, in the, I'm up early in the morning and I sit here. And at first I just noticed, it, it's funny because for a while I noticed that there weren't that there wasn't, there weren't that many bird songs. And then more recent, it almost went a couple of years, but this year there's been a many, there's been a lot, there's been a lot of bird activity in the trees around here. I don't know why that's changed, but it's I just spring. noticed. Yeah. Well, no, no. I mean, from year to year, but, but I just noticed that there, there's a lot of bird chatter. They're, they're, they're really active. And then something happened today where, I didn't just notice it as a general activity, but I started hearing the different songs. And then I started hearing the, uh, the kind of back and forth and the rhythms and the sort of multiple rhythms that are going on. And then I started hearing John Coltrane. <laughs> in the <first> <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wasn't sure if the birds were suggesting that to me or if I was projecting that into them. them. So, Anyway, I, I, those are different kinds of information, yeah, differences right. that make a difference. Right, right. Oh, everybody's muted but me. Does that mean <laughs> it's my turn to speak? Uh, I... I uh, let's see, synchronicity or something like that. Uh, I had occasion to reread David Foster Wallace's uh, uh, short story. It, it, it's supposedly fiction. Uh, Good old neon. It's in the, his last published work before he died, Oblivion. And I almost posted it to this cafe, but I just tuned into this cafe this morning. So nobody would have a chance to read it or listen to it. It's on YouTube. People read it 
the entire uh, essay, short story. Uh, it's absolutely fabulous. It, it talks about language and how inefficient language is to, uh, my word, disseminate what's going on up here. And a lot of it deals with his interaction. It, it, he's just sort of trying to deal with reality, the character, who of course becomes David Wallace. That's postmodernism and whatnot. Uh, deals with his, uh, eventually he seeks psychotherapy to try and figure out what the hell is going on and what he's doing and and uh, and eventually he commits suicide but he talks to the readership via the other side he's already dead and he's he's telling everybody how he came to the logical conclusion that the only sensible thing to do was to kill yourself. Uh, and it's just, it's just so brilliant and it's so apropos to everything going on now uh, that, you know, I don't know. I seriously don't know. Uh, but I find... I find I find Bateson, the guy she was talking to, all this stuff is almost boring. Sorry. One thing that strikes me about everything that's been said thus far, and we talk about language and all of the problems that we have with language. We're always talking about, I'm, I'm gonna use a very oversimplified metaphor from the from communication theory. We're, we're always talking about the sender. The what? The sender, the one that's sending the information, the one that's saying something. And, this was the thing I liked about the Shakespeare quote. It was a plea to listen, as I heard it. It's a plea to listen. And what, what I find lacking in modern discourse is the listening side. We don't listen to what people are saying. We... We jump to conclusions, we draw conclusions, we, we hear a word and, and our thoughts shoot down a particular pathway, but we haven't yet heard or understood or taken in what was actually being said or what's trying to be said. If we all know, and I think all of us here in this group are that way, we all know that the language has weaknesses, yes. And it's very hard sometimes to say exactly what it is that you're trying to say. But who's making the extra effort to figure out what the other person's trying to say and to help them with that? This also ties into what, you know, what Doug had said about family conversations. I find, maybe it's just me, anything anything but shallow. The deepest conversations I have ever had in my life have been about mundane subjects within my own family because they have actually touched on the essence of why it is we may even be here. And, and, they, are, and they are banal to a great extent. But there's a depth to them that we tend to overlook, I think, because we all assume the other person's trying to communicate something from them to me, whereby what they might be doing 
and I think this is more often the case than not, trying to say, can you help me figure this out? What it is that I'm going through, what it is that I'm experiencing, or what it is that I just encountered. And I think that's what, and that's what I heard from you, Mark, about, about Foster's story. It's, it's interesting that the only logical conclusion that the person could come to is suicide, and what does the guy do? Well, he's already figured that out. See, he's already gone down that, but who's listening? We look at it now and we go, oh, isn't that, that nice and wonderful? But actually, he's, I think he was trying to tell us something, and I'm not sure anybody was listening at all because to listen, you actually have to react to what the person is saying. And sometimes, very often, more often than not, the mere reaction is going to cause a reaction that you probably don't want to deal with. And that's the best reaction that you can get. I, I, I mean, I was in Marco. I had two daughters and a, and a stepson. I loved it when they called me out. This was like the highlight of evening dinner. When they got up on their hind legs and said, not just no, but hell no, and this is why. And, <laughs> and this is why. I loved that. I thought that was great. But to get them to do that was like, <laughs> was like the Duke of Burgundy trying to get these two guys. He, he, there's this plea. Will you guys just listen to each other and find out what it is that you do agree on? And this is also something for as boring as it was, I agree with you. There were the large stretches of the that talk that we're boring. But in the end, it was about, are we listening to what the other person is actually saying? And there were a couple of examples, Gil brought that up and he brought up a couple where they had a, where they were going to do the ecological project there back east somewhere, the school was going to expand. And they realized in the end, we all agreed on everything. And that they were, <laughs> they were at each other's throat with, you know, lawyers and whatever. But it, Actually, they agreed on everything because they weren't listening, and we don't we don't listen enough. And the and I, I just finished a, 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 a Nada Brahma book that I've been talking about, and it's all about sound. You know, the world is sound, and that whole thing is that hearing is our most is our strongest sense. It's the one that never shuts off. It's always present. When we're sleeping, we're still listening. That a noise wakes us up if it's not from inside. And 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 we can use we can use sound to orient ourselves in three dimensional space. It's an absolutely phenomenal sense that we have, and it's probably one of the most neglected. But most of our discussions in the last uh, couple of weeks have all centered around sound and listening. But we don't listen. And I think that's, that's part of our, our problem. We need to listen more. And we need to listen closely. And we need to feedback what we're hearing, which is what a lot of us, I'm not saying here in this group that we don't do, but in general situations, we tend not to feedback. Well, what I just heard you say was, and then say that. And the other person goes, that's how often does this happen? That's not what I meant at all. You know? No, not at exactly. All. Like, that, that's exactly. probably true. That's not what you meant at all. That's why I'm saying, why is it that I, I got that? Because I'm so screwed up? Obviously a possibility. But I'm not alone in this conversation. So it's not just me. So we need to go at this again. And you start going through this loops and these loops and these feedback loops. And that all takes time. And, and that's one of the things, this, let's go back to John, because we're, you know, they're all looking at their phones. I have to take my calls. You know, I worked on European projects where everybody was so important to the, to the success of the European Union that they had their phones on all the time until I was at dinner with them. And I made them turn them off. And they were put on the table in a stack. And the first person that grabbed one paid the bill. <laughs> and all of a sudden, nobody needed a phone. <laughs> it's crude. It's rude. I 
understand that, but we talked. We got more work done at dinner than we got done all day in our meetings because we actually stopped and listened to each other because people on the, in, during the meeting were checking their mails, had to check their phone. I have to take this call. The fuck you do. There's no call in the world that you have to take if you're here with me. Not because I'm so important, but because we are together in a group. This is what is important now. I had my nephew over here. He's, he's trying to find a job. So he's, he's all panicking about interview. And I need to help him because he's a business major and he doesn't know anything about behavioral whatever. So I'm talking to him and his phone is buzzing. You know, he's getting a, an SMS and he's getting a, a WhatsApp and, you know, this, that, and whatnot. And he gets up and I go, you're not going to, are you? And he goes, whoa. <laughs> and I said, pick up that phone. And he goes, well, it might be important. I said, if that phone's more important, pick up your phone and walk out the door. Because that's, a, we're here. I'm spending time with you. And if your phone is more important, then we've missed the point. So, My phone's so, ringing. Yeah, I know. My phone rings a lot. I don't pick it up. But if I don't, pick, I'm not one of these people that believes I'm, I'm not, as the Germans would call it, telephone hurish. I am not, I'm not obedient to my phone. If it's important, they'll call back. I'm not going to save the world. I've never saved the world. You know, you guys can guarantee I'm not the guy that's going to save the world. So that phone call can't be that important. And so we have to decide who do we want to listen to? And I always think you have to listen to, to paraphrase the Stephen Still songs. You have to listen to the one you're with. <laughs> and we need to listen more. We don't. We don't listen. What can I can I interrupt and just sort of play devil's advocate? In that, there's two sort of philosophies going on here at once. One is to be present and pay attention <clears throat> to the. The, whatever that word was, the immediate environment around you, uh, the people in front of you, the, the, listen to them. The other is the sort of Buddhist philosophy that the, the, the pebble in the water has this ripple effect. And if you don't pay attention to the, the larger picture, then you're screwing things up. So there's this uh, paradox of just what exactly is going on. Are you part of this, this, this large ecosystem, biosphere, whatever sphere you want to call it, or are you just you and the other, and then to take it, reduce it more, are you is it just what's going on inside your head? Well, personally, I, it's a paradox, and I don't think it's... I that don't think it is. It, a paradox doesn't mean that it has to be locked into a binary way of viewing it. You enter the paradox, you feel the paradox, and maybe they it's both and. Maybe it's all three. Maybe it's also what's what's going on inside your head in the sense that in the sense that how can we we're, how can we know for sure even we're the ones that draw the lines but do we pay attention to where we draw the line and where do we get drawing the line well we get the line from our conditioning one of the things i agree with ed about the listening part is is a factor of listening is we listen we don't know how to listen non-defensively like in listening to you mark right now and the way you were laying it out i was very much aware of how what you were saying and how i might respond but i had to also hold the space that that i'm just listening it's just like listening to music, like you and I've talked about. Listening to music helps you get beyond, to me, 
making music, listening to music helps you get beyond in your listening of it happen, having to be a black and white either or. It's a paradox that you need to learn to dance in and enjoy. And out of that paradox, you will flip, and I'm purposely using that word, flip into a different, maybe more uh, open way of experiencing what's happening here and now with me talking to you at the same time of the Buddhist notion that every fucking thing else in the universe is going on too. It's both and. It doesn't have to necessarily be black and white. What's black and white is how I'm choosing my words and my intensity to get across my message. That was great. Um, I don't know what all you guys are talking about, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> I can just flow the flow. Um, I think that um, we're really up against it in many ways. I, um, let's see, Mark and Marco, you're in Colorado, your physical location. Um, you're pretty much in the same neck of the woods. I'm in New York. Um, Doug is in Kentucky, Ed is in Germany. So what's the immediate environment that we share? Um, I, I, and when we are together in a group, what, is it, what the hell does that mean right now? I mean, our bodies are conventionally separate um, but I'm suggesting, having read the flip and, and discussed that with uh, others here, some of us others uh, have listened to that, but, um, the idea that our minds, because we share a language, are hopelessly entangled. We can't, with language, draw a line. I can do it with a pencil or a pen. <laughs> But that's a, that's a, but we do things with speech that we can't do with anything else. But I'm just suggesting that that's extremely um, fuzzy. And especially if you want to share a reality with another person and you, and if you want to create a new reality. And I'm going to just... I want to go back to Charles Taylor, and this is not easy to talk about, but I think he, he t he's talking about equality. This is something we're hearing a lot about now, about equality and inequality and new meaning. And he's talking, and he uses the example of gay marriage. He says, today gay marriage is demanded as a right in the name of non-discrimination which is another avatar of equality. Think of how this came about. The first key move was made a half a century ago as part of the sexual revolution. This was not just a demand to allow a less restrictive sexual code. It also in some ways changed the subject. The sexual revolution came along with a turn uh, towards eth the ethic of authenticity. So homosexuals had a right to come out without penalty, not just on the older grounds of avoiding gratuitous suffering, but more on the grounds that sexual orientation should be considered as an identity and as such deserved equal respect. This shift in the understanding of equality grows with the spread of an ethic of authenticity with its notion of identity, now used in a new sense. But this word doesn't come after the change. It helps to bring about the change. And we very intentionally said same sex marriage same sex marriage, same sex marriage, every day, hundreds of times, for 25 years. And now we have a new, that was a imaginative leap and we were using language to make, create the conditions where that now is a social reality for a lot of people. Now I have mixed feelings about marriage and it's not something I'm even remotely interested in or for running for a public office, but I am interested in being freed from stigma 
And it's interesting. Um, the other day, I was talking to a perfect stranger and um, in, in a public space on a playground. He was very friendly. He obviously liked me. And we were, we were talking about politics and a lot of other things. He said some very complimentary things about my response to him because I, he says, you really look me straight in the eye and you're paying attention. And this guy is a, a street person. And he was saying, most people don't do that. And he proceeded to um, make some homophobic remarks, just in passing. Uh, they were sort of homophobic remarks. It was, it was sort of like, I don't think he intended any harm to anybody by making those remarks. It was just like some people make, say racist things and they don't think about what they're saying. It's just something that, uh, you know, they feel some, I think he actually thought it was gonna create some solidarity between us. <laughs> and this is a very strange kind of feeling because this has happened to me my whole life where a person really likes me and they think they're gonna bond even deeper by, by uh, uh, sharing homophobic, uh, a homophobic attitude. And on many, many occasions I said, well, by the way, I'm gay which really freaks them out. And they get really mad and say, well, why didn't you tell me that? And I said, well, I just did tell you that. <laughs> and I think that over many, many decades of having to come out in friendly and unfriendly environments, I have had uh, some direct experience with how to create new realities. But I think that we have to recognize there are things you can do legally like uh, I stop discrimination. And then there's other kinds of uh, relational, um, you know, you, you can't change the hearts and minds of people if they don't want to change their hearts and minds. You just can't. But you don't have to hang out with those people. That's why I don't have anything to do with my family. Um, my father, right before he died, he wanted to have a relationship with me. And I didn't really want to have one with him. And he asked me why, and I told him. And um, it was a, and I told him a lot of things. And at the end of the conversation, I'll never forget, he said, you have been very gentle with me. I was not gentle with you. And he also said, I guess this is communication. <laughs> Uh, better late than never, Dad. Um, but I think these are the kind of things that, um, you know, they do get into your nervous system, language, and people who told you to shut up or called you a faggot or a queer or a nigger or whatever. Um, those, those kinds of, that kind of speech, if you're unprotected, can get into your nervous system and really fuck you up. Um, because language is, is magical. And also people can say the sweetest, kindest things. They can use a sweet, kind, tender voice. And, but the content of what they say can be absolutely vicious. Um, living in the South, I, I, I notice these Southern bells who talk so sweet. But if you really listen to what they're saying, what they're saying is pretty awful. Um, and I think these are the kind of double messages, the, you know, the forked tongue. And we all have to learn how to do it. Um, um, it can be what irony is about and what humor, where humor comes from. And it can also be, in certain circumstances, ambiguous language can be extremely dangerous, especially if you're trying to create a, a peace treaty between warring nation states. Um, so anyway, I'm just sharing that because I don't know why, but I just am. I think it's something to do with maybe our maturity as, as, as communicators in, in a public forum, in a public space, and our responsibility towards the group. And as I do my best, if I bring forward a first person account of anything, is it for the group? Is it for the benefit of the group? If it's not, I can keep it to myself or just put it down in my diary. But as I think as, a, as we starting to get more and more complex and dealing with the this technology and with the immense speed of this technology and the, the fragmentation uh, and the stress on communities. 
I think it's a, a, a kind of wonderful thing if we commit ourselves to coming together and allowing ourselves, you know, permission to talk outside of what we already know and to take a few risks and um, create these uh, mixed discourse events as I think we're doing today. So thanks. What I, what I uh, think I hear you saying, John, is you're drawing a very strong distinction between hearing and listening. It sounds kind of like a broken recipe, but we don't, we hear everything that everyone says to us, but we were what they're saying. It, in, in the United States, the, the roads to, um, would say a more equal sexual orientation acceptance was a lot rougher than it was elsewhere. Here in Europe, it happened relatively quickly and relatively without any fanfare or whatnot. Um, the, my, the business partner from my daughter, when she had her business back in 2010, um, they were a, a, gay, a gay couple. Well, they got married in Denmark. And the nice thing about the European Union was, even though Germany did not have a, a law that sanctioned um, same-sex marriages, since they were married in a European country that did, Germany had to recognize it. And so for 15, 20 years, Germany was recognizing same-sex marriages, even though they themselves did not have a law that sanctioned that, so to speak. So there's kind of like a default, well, you are. So all of the things that applied to married couples in Germany, by law, applied to same-sex marriages, even though Germany didn't have a law for it. We have other problems that are basically the same. We still have in Germany and elsewhere a very strong undercurrent of a far-right nationalism. There's a lot of neo-Nazis running around in Germany. Now, one of the things that people say that we have to do, okay, well, we have to forbid the NPD, which is the, the, the neo-Nazi party. And I go, well, why? Let them talk. We need to listen to what they're saying. Somewhere, the shoe's pinching the foot. Why? What are, they, what are they actually on about? And if we don't listen, we won't know. And trying to push them underground, which is what happened in the United States with same-sex marriages, and what, everything got pushed underground. It, it only goes in just like when you repress something psychologically, you know, for it, for it'll, sooner or later, it, it doesn't go away. It just simmers and bubbles and you know the cauldron is still boiling and somewhere it's going to come out and it's going to come out in a way that you don't really want to deal with and part of the problem is is because we're not listening to what people are saying you know where where is the actual problem and what you find out in a lot of cases there's no problem at all it's just the perception we think that things are a certain way that they're not why is it, I'll go back to the Nora Bateson thing, why is it that everybody was threatening legal action and in the end they agreed on everything? Because they finally listened to each other. It took a while, but they listened and they realized they had more in common than they had different. But it took, according to the little anecdote that was called, three rounds through the, system, through the, the discussion in order to come to that. So, we, we need to take everything that someone says to us, we need to take seriously. I like your, your anecdote with the person who thinks, oh, I'm going to, I can bind with this person by saying something that I perceive he's going to hear differently than what, how it's meant. When you call them on, you know, it depends on how you call them on. And you just go, well, that's not the way it is. And then you know, and then he knows. And it's amazing how often people go, well, I didn't really mean it that way <laughs> for some strange reason, because 
there's this other aspect. There's an aspect of binding. There's an aspect of coming together that, they, that everyone appreciates. And then we realize there's some little detail that separates us. And we have to decide, are we going to raise that to the level of actual separation? Or am I going to let it go? But we can only find that out if we really start listening to what other people are trying to say. And to do that, we need to constantly be providing feedback in some way so that we find out what that is. Go ahead, Michael. And I have a question. With listening, it seems like as a sensory function, it, it's different than you know, speaking. Listening has more of a sense of receptivity, which in a way also relates to vulnerability. In a way, you know, in the sense maybe why we don't learn, uh, or maybe why we hear and we don't listen is that there is a subtle vulnerability in listening well or listening deeply because I will encounter that discomfort of having to say, no, that's not what I meant. Uh, you got it wrong. <laughs> the nature of recept receptivity is vulnerability. Okay. It, 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 that, that's just part of it. Okay. You have to be willing, I believe, I believe, you have to be willing to deal with that. Okay. I agree 100%, like you often mentioned. We're not brought up to be that way. And we're not brought up to allow ourselves to be hurt. We always have to react to, to whatever hurt or whatever it is. But if, if one is a, in, I was a language teacher for a, a large part of my life. I don't, I don't have a career. <laughs> Even when I was a language teacher, and they talk about, you know, reading and writing, uh, you know, and listening and speaking. Well, writing and speaking are considered active language uh, skills and reading and, and uh, listening are considered passive. But we have associations with active and passive that aren't necessarily appropriate. True. True. You, have, you have to be an active listener. Just like when we're reading, we have to be highly engaged with what we're reading. There's, there is so much activity that's going on there. It's anything but passive. And when we're, when we're actively listening and actively reading, we start, we start awakening our own critical faculties, which is what comes out in, in our discussions here, because that's what everybody here does. We have active listeners and readers. And, and that is not generally distributed throughout the population. Most people I know don't even hear what you, you're saying, let alone are actively listening to what you're saying. I don't know how many times, even here, here in a family, because my daughter is always distracted about something. So I'll say, you know, something. And then later she'll come back in panic mode because this didn't happen. I said, well, I told you this morning I was going to do that. Well, she missed that because she was all wrapped up in whatever it is she was wrapped up in. I'm going, I know that happens all the time. You know, I can at least at my age when I don't quite get things <laughs> fall back on, well, I must be getting senile. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that, that, that part, but then, but everyone knows, okay, now I fess up, now I'm aware of that, and we'll, we'll deal with it as it is. So, so they're, they're generally referred to as these kind of aspects of language, but they're not as cut, it's not as cut and dry as everything else. So you have to be an active listener and an active reader, just like you have to be an active speaker, but you also have to be a receptive speaker. You have to think about, for example, when you're writing, Mark knows this, I'm sure at some point, probably more often than he may want to admit, he was thinking about the person that was eventually going to be reading the words on the page. He, he's, he's engaged with the reader before the reader even starts reading. 
and he doesn't know if that reader is going to actively read it or passively read it. But he's still trying to make whatever it is that he's saying clear enough so that in any, in any case, should a dialogue ever occur, which is kind of what we would like if we're writing and presenting and talking and speaking, getting feedback, that I can interact and deal with that. So generally speaking, yes, active, passive, but it's not quite that way. It's always some no. combination. No, it's it's not. And 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 in this group, that's there. There's a, a in this group. That's why I like it because, like you stated, there's critical, and we're readers, and we're and we do we do active listening, or I I prefer the term non-defensive because I want to make sure that I'm not def trying to get you know uh, trying to de get react over overly reactive to somebody's point of view. I may have a reaction, but that's not the same as being reactive. Uh, but so I just want to share a, 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 something that happened to me this morning that goes along with this thread. I got a call. I was at Back to the Grind, where you guys seen the pictures of the, the jazz <laughs> that took place. Um, I got a call from my daughter who wanted to have breakfast with me, which is just out of the blue, not that often. And this ties into Marco and Gregory Batson and daughter. There's something about a father and daughter relationship that uh, I just, I have a, and, and I have a special kind of mysterious thing about. And so she called me and we had breakfast and at a place called Simple Simons. And I happen to know she's going through a lot of stress right now because she's having to move. She's having to, she's going through some changes right now. And um, we sat and talked. And one of the things as her dad, I wanted to remind her, but I had to listen. I had to listen to the timing of trying to share a sort of mindfulness of how she can work with the stress. Breathe, feel your feet. Breathe out, relax, you know, because she is a nurse. She's in a high stress job and then she's going through this. And it was just, I, I just took the opportunity to try to do the, not just because of her, uh, yeah, it's because I'm a dad, but I also, if it was a friend, I would want to try to engage on that level. But the critical point is, is I really had to pay attention and listen, when could I share what I needed to share? That listening to how I listen, if I can use it that way, is really, really uh, important from my point of view. And I've only learned how to do that through, for me personally, I've only learned how to do that by meditating. Because meditation, if there's one thing it teaches you, if you really work with it, is, like you said, listening is all the listening is on all the time and part of meditation that they'll tell you is da, 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 you're always talking so how do you sit with that chattering and find the gaps of silence which there is gaps so thank you for listening i think i might have just a couple of notes on that um, because there's this physical dimension to listening. You don't just hear semantic content and then do a little computation to interpret it and decode what it means. Um, it actually, there's sound, right? So those are little vibrations right, that, that hit the body as a whole, but then the ears are particularly able to in respond to that sound to what is that that there's that um i think nora tries to talk about this like that that just sensitivity what a system can hear and when i meditate part of what i learned to do is just like you know i've gone through many different teachings like pay attention to your breath pay attention to sensations um, label your, your thoughts. I mean, there are many different teachings, different visualizations or what have you. 
I just got confused between like what what exactly what what kind of meditation should I be doing? What am I doing here? I'm sitting and I just broke it down to like the basics. Like what am I act there's some posture when you sit and meditate, right? So your body assumes a certain posture that there's different words for that. There's different jargon for that. You can call it an asana, you can call it a mudra, whatever you want to call it. But you you the body in a certain posture becomes receptive in a certain way. And the stillness becomes a receptivity, but it's a receptivity to all the kind of subtle things that happen as in the body, through the body. The body acts as a sort of nexus of um, all kinds of things, right? Uh, but what was I doing? I realized I have to just listen to what's happening. Listen to, and, and what am I listening for? I don't, I'm not sure, but you start to hear things. I'm not saying semantic things because it's a hearing that isn't a tuning. It's like more like a feeling hearing. I think listening and feeling are very close. So I, the other elemental piece of meditation for me was feeling because everything that you hear feels a certain way. And that's where poetry comes from, I think, is the musicality of how things can, you know, how, of the interplay between semantic content and aesthetic feeling. And that I think also is in conversation is when you feel you can make that um, suggestion or um, respond to something that you heard. Um, it's very natural, but I think that we, our capacity to do it has been interrupted. It's been interrupted and kind of, it's like, <clears throat> scrambled it's been it's been it's been really hijacked it's been fucked with like it's really fucked up at least i feel that personally that it, it's difficult to communicate uh partly because we're because of the you know the the interfaces that we have in organic situations we would have our full body interfaces here we have th these screens i'm talking into a microphone i'm hearing my own voice through headphones everything is the whole circuitry is totally different right so and I don't think we've ad quite adapted or been able to integrate our disparate cir circuitries and the different kinds of systems, like the mechanistic closed systems and then the biotic living open systems. Uh, those are not in harmony right now. Um, I don't mean necessarily right here and now, but as a general, here and now, but also as a general, general social stage. You know, there's this sort of, Maybe it's transitional. Maybe there is a harmony to be found, a, a balance to to be um, to be struck. Uh, I hope. I would hope so. I mean, when is when is you know when do, is there enough technology? When is there enough systems? Like at a certain point, shouldn't there be enough? And then <laughs> life goes on. You know, you just use what you have and do your thing as a living organism rather than as a, a machine trying to achieve some kind of outcome. Um, anyway, I'm just going to, I'm just rambling now. No, I, <laughs> I, I really appreciate it that Marco. Um, and I'm thinking about, well, when you're sitting in a Lotus pose and you have your posture, good posture and you're feeling grounded uh, and, and you're, whatever you're watching, you're breathing or whatever, there can be, uh, a very enjoyable, after you've settled down, kind of coherence. Uh, sort of like if you shake up a, a, a bottle with a soda in it and it'll be fuzzy, be fizzing all over the place, but if you, you know, leave it alone, it'll all settle down. So that I think is the principle behind mo much of our meditation practices. And I, and I believe it is very necessary, but you gotta do more than just that. Um, I think a, a temporary feeling of coherence can really be enjoyed. Um, individuals are often able to, to do that. I don't think groups are very good at it at all, unless they have a plan. You know, you have a score, uh, you have a script, uh, or you're gonna, you're gonna perform in a certain way. And then you have, uh, you, you enter into a, a shared rhythm with others. 
and you get entrained with them. And it's a very enjoyable ascetic effect that happens when we listen to poetry or we read poetry or, or when, when we're in a group that becomes coherent. It takes the benefits the, the, of a private sort of meditation practice into a public space. It can be quite uh, enjoyable and we crave it. We want that to happen. Um, so we listen, come together and listen to music or play music or recite poetry together. And I'm, I'm really interested in creating coherent we spaces. And that, that personal pronoun I and that, that we, that mysterious we, and when that happens. And I think if, they, if we can register the feelings in our body, the images, the words we use, when we're feeling coherent in a group, and then also let's be very sensitive to those feelings and images and the contents of our speech when we feel incoherent. Because that's often a very important communication that when that incoherent feeling is registered in your psyche, your soma, others are going to pick up on that. And what happens with that is very important because there's usually something that's incongruent or incoherent in the person. There may be different parts. Um, there may be certain, uh, they may be entering into a liminal zone. Um, they may be in spaces that, you know, that, that are very unfamiliar with them. And I believe we need to find a way of being, of maintaining a kind of tender sobriety where we can allow others to have their moments where they don't have their act together. And they're, they're going into those, uh, those liminal spaces. And um, while still maintaining, without decohering, I think uh, uh, our, social space, our social spaces become richer and more resilient when we can maintain a kind of coherence while uh, certain members are having a moment, you know, uh, where they're, you know, flipping out many of us are flipping out more and more often. I think that was such a wonderful title of that book, uh, The Flip. Um, as we're moving out of a Newtonian kind of worldview into something much more quantum, uh, we're gonna to have to acknowledge the entangled nature of our language and our minds. And it's, a, it's very, very stressful right now. But I think we can achieve a more coherence in our groups if we're allowing people to work with those different parts of themselves. But it takes a lot of maturity to do that in a group. And it depends on the level of maturity of the individuals. And if we come together with that intention and that purpose, then I believe uh, we can have a higher success rate than if we're just flying by the seat of our pants. I mean, we, we're, we're clueless. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's a good idea to bring in uh, that sense of incoherence into a we space that is decoherent. I do not recommend that. I've done it before and it's a bad idea. Um, so I think that's the challenge for us is how can we create coherent enough we spaces so that something different can happen than what we already know. Because we can sit here and spout the conventional stuff we already know pretty well. and um, Or we can acknowledge, uh, this is kind of confusing and this is kind of bizarre, this may be even a little weird, but I'm gonna say it anyway. And, you know, realize that that's not going to destabilize the system. The system actually gets stronger and more resilient when enough members uh, are able to do that. Um, so it does take a lot of patience, I think, and being very, very tuned into um, those feelings when you get them that, oh, this feels really weird or, you know, this is an unusual sensation. And, oh, I think I'll just ignore it. Um, and that may be the wisest thing to do, but sometimes you may not want to ignore it. And I, I think this is something that uh, these are the kind of skills uh, that we can develop as sponsors. We can sponsor one another in that. And a meditative practice can help, definitely helps a lot. But I think more than that is practicing some sort of art, writing poetry or uh, playing or listening to music. Um, I think that achieves something just as important as far as uh, maintaining the quality of our of, of coherent we spaces. And I, I'm, I'm here because I think it's an emergency situation. I think we're falling apart very rapidly and we're making, we're all transitional beings. 
And there's no guarantee any of us going to make it. Um, so I think the system is very perturbed, but the more occasions we can create these mixed discourse events um, that are coherent enough, I think the better. So I think this is a, is a very noble um, experiment we're all engaged in, uh, a safe to fail, I hope, experiment. So thanks. Uh, John, thank you, because I totally agree with you. And I think one of the arts that you left out that we practice here is the art of conversation. <laughs> so this place is like where I come to as a way to practice, to model that uh, I, I'm a broken record on this, I know. But so many times I think by coming here has helped me uh, be intimate with a skill that I was able to use with my daughter today. Um, and it's very intimate and friendships with you guys are very intimate and and it helps uh, counter counter the fucking mechanistic AI shit. <laughs> Just to get that out of my system. Unfortunately, I was muted, but I was I was that was a big belly laugh. I laughed at that. <laughs> I think the word coherence is interesting because if you take it apart, it's co collective and here, there's some kind of a place and we're all in places, but we're not together in our physical places, but we are, we do share these physical streams of image and sound. So there is a here-ness, but it's a virtual here-ness. And I, I think that there's a, um, a non-binary way of looking at that because we do have, like our physical location matters, the state of my body matters, the coherence of my environment matters, and then everything that's going on out, outside of these four walls, how many, <laughs> ceiling, <laughs> floor, right? Uh, even underground, uh, you know, you don't deal with this on the East Coast as much, but here we have things like uh, fracking, and you, know, you could be sitting in your, as has happened, sitting in your house and you're, it blows up. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's kind of in a cartoon way, it's funny, but it was like really horrific and tragic. And um, so sense of place, sense of virtual place that harmonizes physical places. If there, um, voice, I think is part of this as well i know that i'm not even i'm getting still used to hearing my own voice and my voice sounds different when i'm by myself than when i'm talking with other people there's some gap there there's a differential in comfort in size expanse like how free it feels how coherent it feels uh, i'm learning to be more comfortable with, with my own incoherence and that's just has been that's just gone with the territory for a long time but to be comfortable with social incoherence is a little bit different there's more there's more dynamics at play and they're in they're entangled john used the phrase hopelessly entangled and it's funny because i used that exact phrase in a communication with somebody else but a private communication so it wasn't he couldn't have seen it um I may have, I don't know where it came from. It may have come from him originally. So that's, that's like what the quantum weirdness, I think that happens in sort of non-Newtonian social space. Uh, and yeah, this is, it, it's, it, it is, it is, I'm feeling a little bit good and coherent right now, but I, I hope, I, I'm sure it's cool. Uh, and I've stayed a lot longer than I than I was intending to, but it's it's because what began emerging felt like it took priority over what I thought I had to get done, which I still have to get done, but um, I think was not as important. I know Pascal, the great French philosopher, said that he was talking about the interstellar spaces. He says, those interstellar spaces frighten me. 
the interstellar spaces don't frighten me, but this group sometimes scares the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of people, I, I, I like groups, but they also- right. so, John. Yeah, really. Um, these groups have a dynamism that's in, intrinsically unpredictable. And I don't, I may have a rough idea about what I want to say, but you don't really know what you're going to say until you've said it. And then you can reflect upon it and say, well, that wasn't it at all. And I think other people go through some, it's a very similar process. Uh, and we're in constant revision mode. So we may say something today and it, and we'll, where the hell did I come up with that? That was a dumb idea, but we won't know that. That was a dumb idea unless we had a space where we could explore it and revise it. And I think that's what's uh, scary about groups. If you've had a history of not being received particularly well by a group, and I think that's in our factory model, it, you know, our, our educations very often we were shunned or told we were stupid or told to shut up and sit down. That happened often enough. We just sort of gave up. And um, I think that can happen to people. So it's a, a kind of re-education and maybe an acceptance. Okay, we're all pretty, some of us are very traumatized. Some of us less so. Some of us have our good days, but we're very coherent. And some days we're incoherent. And some days we're in between. So I think it's, when you're living in a big city as I do, I walk down the street and I'll notice that person, I'll look at their face. And I'm, I have a theory of mind. I can look at a face and figure out what's going on internally with a person. And so can all of us. So I'm looking, oh, that person's very, I, I, they're having a good day. That person's having a bad day. <laughs> this person's somewhere in between. And you can, and that, you can pick up on that. And that can become, um, you can also start to be picking up on other people's moods. And some of those moods are really awful. So you have to be careful about whose mood is, is you're picking up on. So we're driven a lot by affects and tones of voice, as you said, uh, Marco, are very important. And you know when someone's uh, having a bad day or a good day, when they're telling you the truth or lying to you, those are always under the surface and usually conveyed by tones and gesture and something you know in the face. So I think that's um, uh, sort of embarrassing in a way reading, reviewing some of these videos as I've often done because I'm interested in discourse and studying discourse. I, I notice some of the, you know, I, I look at my own experience as here I am speaking to you in this sort of technical artificial environment in some ways and what's authentic and what's inauthentic can move around quite a bit from member to member here. But when you review these, they're artifacts and they're frozen and they're not going to change. And so it's a, it's a very different kind of experience because then you're no longer a participant, you're an observer. And I think uh, this is a different kind of discourse that we're sort of evolving because we have YouTube and we have these different kind of performances. Like we're, this is a performance for me right now. Uh, and then they become an artifact that can be archived and pulled up as uh, our friend Douglas often does, he'll, he'll pull up some of these past conversations that are in the archive and he'll highlight a feature from one of those and he'll make that a topic for a future uh, cafe. So I think we can all do that. Uh, and I think this is something new that this technology is providing us. Uh, so there are several threads going on right now. Some of us are participants in, in one or two of them are, and we can refer to those. So I feel like what we did, what we have been doing at the Bateson Group has been kind of lonely. Uh, there are more people at the beginning. A lot of them have dropped out. There's basically three of us now, Jeffrey, Doug, and I, and Michael has joined uh, more recently. Um, but I think these are kind of little work groups. We gather together and we do a little work group and it's not gonna be for everybody, but hopefully in our work groups, we learn something, we can bring it into the larger community and so it doesn't become just a sort of a secret society over here and another secret society over there. And none of these secrets are being shared. Um, so it's, ho it's my hope that we can get better at giving feedback to one another. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is what I want more of. Even if I did not, even if I was not a participant, I can still give feedback. So if I'm not in one of these cafes, I can re replay it and I can have a response to it. 
And on occasion I have, I, in the thread, if there's a thread that started up, I'll like, hey, this is what I like, this is what I didn't like, this is what I want, wish I had more of. And uh, that could be a great benefit. So if you, even if you don't have the time and energy to do a reading and join a call, be a participant, you could be offering a great service just by saying, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I saw this video and this is what I liked or didn't like about it or what I want more of. So that's what that way I think that those who are making these efforts in these, in these smaller groups don't feel so alone. <laughs> I mean, it feels like sometimes Jeffrey, Doug and I, we're at the, at the edge of doom <laughs> trying to talk about uh, these very complex Batesonian notions, logical levels and uh, incoherent in, in communication and mixed messages, the analog and digital. I mean, this is not easy stuff and it's really hard, hard work. Um, and I know all of us are working really hard at something and bringing it, bringing our best to these forums. Um, I think, uh, and having these kind of meta discourse, uh, these communications about our communications is extremely valuable. And I think very rare. I don't think a whole lot of this is going on. Um, most of it's just yakety yak, don't talk back, you know, kind of this, you know, um, but I think we, we, we press the pause button and go meta to our discourse and like, what the hell is this all about? I think that's a, that can be very creative and necessary. Thanks. That's what Samathacy means. Uh, the word that she's coined is the mutual learning. But we're also doing, I think, uh, mutual thinking. We're, we're thinking aloud, as a few of us have mentioned. Putting it out there, um, I appreciate it. Or at least the key phrase that I'm taking away is uh, the key to re receptivity is vulnerability. Ed, Ed referred to it earlier in uh, the context of listening, of hearing the other. And I think it can be broadened into the context of uh, when I hear vulnerability that it's asking for an opening up or a sort of openness that allows for the, the cutting through of the, the mundane uh, of the what's already ingrained, what's already there, your preconceived notion. Um, so in conversation that that means cutting through anything really, the bullshit somebody's saying and calling them out on it or cutting through your own mess of ideas and listening, receiving. And, or, or on the other side of Marco being outside and receiving the, the bird call and um, performing jazz with the birds or, or at least listening to a jazz performance by the birds. But he, he wouldn't be open to that if he perhaps didn't have his meditation background or it wasn't outside because his daughters were running around outside. He might have been inside doing work that he didn't want to do or something. Um, my, my bird example is uh, we, my, my younger son just turned one, Vincent, uh, when he's, got, he's an, at an attachment phase since my wife, his mother, started working. He's, we get a little bit of time in the morning, separation, and when she comes back home, he clings a lot more than he used to. So in the mornings when we're doing breakfast and she's holding on to him, then places him in, into a seat, there's, there's this disconnect that he starts crying and we distract him. We have a window by the, the table and we say, oh, but there, there's also an intergenerational context going in my own household. So there's the Filipino language being spoken. So we'll distract him and say, Ibon, Ibon, bird, bird, um, outside. And so he'll go, huh? huh? Because he, he wants to find what we're interested in. He, he is interacting with our, our own movements and our questioning. He, he knows what we're saying at this point. He can't say bird just yet, but he's interested in 
where is that bird? When we're outside, he's searching for birds, or he, he can point now to the sky when a bird flies by. And this in turn has caused me to remember um, my recent love for birds, rediscovered love for birds. Perhaps I had it when I was younger. And I've heard these calls. Um, I've noticed robins. Robins are the bird of the spring, I've noticed. And after reading a, a book on robins with my, my older son, I now know more about robins than I would probably learn in a class if I was sitting there just by this book and going outside and I hear their calls. I know what stage they are in their life. I can recognize the younger robins. So that's just an example of all the context within one, one little issue we have with a, a young one to try to distract them so we don't have to listen to crying all the time um, can turn into this world of ideas and the adult version of that is we're, we're playing here we're learning and we always seem to appreciate it whether we'd like to say it or not so again this is a, a thank you <laughs> any others with that final thoughts I would want to add to that the reason I was listening to the birds was because I was sensitized to listen to the birds through the discourses that I had um, become aware of, read. Uh, I can't even pinpoint where exactly it was because it was kind of atmospheric in a certain way. I've heard, I heard it in multiple locations at, at once. It was like oral. Maya, for example, on the forum uh, has written about birds. John has shared about birds. We've talked about crows and cracking nuts. Uh, it's come up in poetry. It's come up in music. And so then when I heard birds, I listened instead of just hearing it as background noise. So I just was reminded of that uh, by, by your example. And... Um, yeah, and the intergenerational, like, I think that that's the kind of thing that also gets passed on, like that, that, that intergenerational, like how we listen, how we, what we notice, uh, that that gets like what, what you as a, as a dad point out, even if it's for utilitarian reasons, which is often the case. Um, but that could, that doesn't have to be in conflict with this learning opportunity. Like, and it's not learning in an educational sense of like picking up a fact. It's more learning in the being, becoming attuned to one's environment, just being attuned to the environment. Uh, and there's a lot more going on than you might think, right? Or that you might learn in school. So all, all these conversations are, I, I think they're a milieu, I think they're a generative milieu. And sometimes there isn't an immediate response. It's something that you hear, that you've listened to, and that doesn't have an immediate response, but you've internalized. Like I've listened to the generations conversations, like all, all of them, at least twice. And um, I don't have a particular response, but there's something resonant there that is sort of working its way in, into my nervous system. Uh, but it hasn't like, it hasn't reached a, a terminus where it will branch into some kind of new growth. But it's, it's kind of worming its way through, but worming sounds too. Worming in, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a per, <laughs> permacultural sense, you know? Like worming as in preparing the soil for something, like aerating the soil, nourishing the soil. I think that all that happens in, in, communities of discourse and that it, it's not an abstraction it's not a, it's not theoretical it's actually uh, and even if it's virtual it still is real that that's what's i think um very curious about all this and i think it's also vital I mean, be, because of what is um i mean what i think about when I, the perspective I bring to the birds is, oh, they may not be around for that much longer. Uh, 
birds eat insects and insects are going extinct. And, uh, you know, this is just in the news yesterday, the UN, you know, report that synthesizes thousands of different studies. I mean, it's official right now that, that we're, we have an imminent, you know, massive extinction event, imminent, not just imminent, but ongoing, uh, like happening right now. Uh, so that's in the background, but we could also listen, like we can also pay attention to that. I mean, what is so, it's totally mainstream. There's nothing, I mean, it's not even marginal, but what does it mean? <laughs> you know, like, I don't think that that's been, that's not clear at all, I think yet. I mean, or it is clear, but but what does it mean? Like, as far as, um, uh, I mean, I think I think there are many layers to that, but some of it is just personal choice. Like, how are you going to spend your time? How how are you going to going to direct your attention? I mean, maybe that's really really what it boils down to. And um, so I think talking is a step is a good step. Uh, it's a good it's a good step, but it's to me a milieu that should be generative of transformations, like structural transformations, behavioral transformations, like. Uh, institutional changes. I mean, all that has to has to come. Uh, so that's that's it for me today. For uh, now, I just, I just remembered from the flip. It was Jill Taylor, the one with Stroke of Insight. She was the one that put out how language affects our neural anatomy. Mm, oh yeah, I've saw I've seen that. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. That that was like a flip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was like flipped like onto your head, like upside down. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just the, 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 whatever you want to call it, that she was an actual studying the neurology of the brain and she has a stroke and she even says that, well, oh, that put me in a inside view. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed today's conversation. Thank you all very much. I just have a, I know we're running out of time, but Doug, are you the one who came up with a title for this? Inter, inter what is it? So we, we could uh, talk about that for another 30 minutes because I, I've typed in, I think, intersteeping interstitia. Okay, with, okay. Uh, or interstitium, which Ed, I believe, changed to interstices. Interstice. Okay, that okay. So, so it's a group and effort. <laughs> we could have a conversation on that for a couple of hours, actually. So maybe that'll be the next cafe of why Ed changed the the language that I decided I thought were good words. Well, well, it sounds like someone's giving and receiving good feedback um, because right. I think for me, I was like when I heard that title, I said, "What what the fuck are these people talking?" About? <laughs> <laughs> no, intersteeping is something that Nora brings up in. Um, I don't remember if it was the essay or the girlfriend conversation. Well, yeah, well, near I the like, end of that conversation. Well, I just wanted to say though, once I had that initial, what the fuck? And then I went, well, I don't know. I think that's what Mark and Ed were saying at the beginning. Maybe something Wallace the Stevens. Time? There's It had a kind of Wallace Stevens, kind of wobbly in between. You know how Wallace Stevens says things, you don't know what he's saying, what he's talking about, but it has a pleasant kind of buzz you get from it. I think Shakespeare does that too. It's like, I don't know what he's talking about, but it feels good. Um, so I'm just wondering, and this is maybe not be for this conversation, but um, have you learned anything about that? The title that Ed or whoever chose. And as this comes to a close, we've been performing around many different themes. But I think it's the nature of the looking for a theme or a frame uh, and how do we find something that works uh, I think this is, I think this has worked today. I think it's been effective. And I want to applaud everyone for their participation and their observing and participating. And um, I hope we can um, do more of this and do it on purpose. Thank you. I'd like to give Ed a chance to talk to perhaps, but um, just a reminder that any cafe is a wiki. So if you want to change the title, you could change the date if you wanted to, but that make things a little harder on some people. But anytime you don't like something, just change it and see what happens. That's an open invitation. It's not a matter of not liking, it's a 
what John had addressed. It's a matter of understanding. And I didn't get the interstitia. It sounded too Latin to me. And interstices is the English word. That's all. And it, I, I, like, I like the change because the rhythm of both words is the same. Intersteeping, interstices. Um, it is something that came up in the conversation with the, the friend. I, only, I want to make one small comment about what is the difference between real and virtual? When I was, before I got my gimpy left hand and I can't finger a ukulele anymore, I was trying to teach myself how to play the ukulele. And so you learn how to finger chords or play scales or whatever it is. And you can practice all day and all night and you'll get better. But before you go to sleep, you can also think about how the fingerings are and you get better. You don't have to actually do it. You can think about it and it improves. So is that real or is that virtual? I'll leave that as an open question. <laughs> because a lot of what we do here, we think is virtual, but it's real because we're doing it. And here at the very end, I'd like to go back to a notion that Marco brought up at the very beginning about terroir, that French word about the flavor of the earth. <laughs> it just so happens that the French are actually, the, the German word for France is Frankreich, the, 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 the kingdom of the Franks. And the Franks were a Germanic tribe that settled further to the west and drove out all of the Celtic people that were in France at that time. But there's still a part of Germany that's called Franken, which is called Franconia, because not everybody moved when everybody moved. And it's a very interesting point to me. If you ask a Frenchman, what's important about wine? And wine plays a very significant and important role in French culture. And a French person will tell you, you have to taste the earth. You have to know where this wine was grown. But if you ask a German, what's important about wine? <laughs> <laughs> the German will tell you, if you don't feel the sun, it's not good wine. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just wanted to throw that in at the end. <laughs> there are very different ways to look at the same thing, and both of them, both of them are worth experiencing. I concur. I concur. That was a great joke. <laughs> 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 Hmm. Bye bye, fellas. Thank you all. Take Have care, everybody. Hang ten. Bye bye. Yeah. Or however many you got. <laughs>